Hopefully we could arrange it for a few people, but we're gonna at least see it well. Oh, that's brilliant. Now, you know, the Casa Vaccalino, I assume that's very close to what was the original line of departure. For, for, uh, for, for which one? Well, where do you, where are you actually Rocca di Raffino, from? is that, is, is that. But Casa, what was there, the place? There's a house that was partly destroyed. Yeah. That's Vaca dei Rafari. Oh, okay. Yeah, Ravari. We'll go there. And, and when uh, you went to Dallas Bay, isn't that close to where they jumped off of yeah, then? Yeah, yeah. Right. So they, they, we jumped off from Dallas Bay itself, right. basically. So you've been uh, there before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, we, having attacked Dallas Bay, we lucked out, and we were in reserve on the April 14th day. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here. That yeah, was really a bloody day. <clears throat> so it's just one of those things. Take turns and... A lot of this is just luck. Yeah. I'm just absolutely convinced of it. Um, <clears throat> Oh, that's brilliant! It was. We we've done a pretty. We done, it's it's a well planned tour, and uh, What's, I, what I like is you, there's enough of the same things, but then okay. All right. Well, tell me when you speak. 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 Okay. Well, I'm going to just start by having you say and spell your complete name. Okay. Well, I'm nervous. Go ahead. Oh no! You know your. <laughs> can you say and spell your complete name? Say that. Can you say and spell your complete name? <laughs> well, don't be nervous oh, about this that. Is, yeah. John Embry. Okay. No middle initial. And spell it for me. J O H N I M B R I E. Okay, Start perfect. with something easy. <laughs> that part you know. <clears throat> How about your highest rank served in the 10th Mountain Division? I was a private first class. All the way? All the way. Um, Never demoted. <laughs> and what was your particular, um, did you specialize at all within uh, the division? Well, I was a, what is called a BAR man. I, my weapon was a Browning automatic rifle. Weighed 20 and a half pounds, very heavy, and fired 20 rounds uh, either automatically or semi-automatically, like a small machine gun, had a bipod on the front, and it was an effective weapon, but heavy uh, to carry. Well, don't think I'm getting fresh, but how much did you weigh? I weighed, ah, I weighed 150 pounds. Well, actually, so that was something for Collinson, who died earlier this year, sadly, a wonderful man why he picked me as a BAR man. He said, I thought it would build you up. <laughs> he was doing you a favor. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Now, Scotty, you could come in a lot more than that. So oh, that yeah, I was just... Uh, okay. Um, tell me the years, that, the dates that you entered the service and Yeah, discharged. I entered um, in 19, early in 1944. Went to Camp Swift, Texas. No. Start again. I entered the service in early in 1944. I went first to Camp Croft, South Carolina, North Carolina, where I uh, had basic training. In those days, I was headed for the 10th with my three letters of recommendation, but in those days, the um, soldiers got their basic training, not at Camp Hale as they did earlier, but at regular training. So I did my basic training at North Carolina and went home for a leave and was headed with my skis to C Camp Hale when I got a telegram saying, go to Camp Swift, Texas. I wondered, how am I going to ski down here? So I never actually went to Camp Hale. I've been there many times since and did my basic training um, and we reported to the 10th for duty at um, um, Camp Swift, Texas. And what year were you discharged? Discharged? Discharged. In, uh, probably October 45. I had six months training, six months in combat, and six months in the hospital, and that was my army career. Do you think I should make a trip upstairs to ask him to jump around somewhere else? <laughs> Except for over our heads. Yeah, I think not, you should. Not, not yet. I think you Just, should take it out. Okay, that sounds good. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell him, yeah. Um, well, you, you've got the earphones on. Yeah. You say what yeah, you I'll, I'll just No, no, stay, stay. Oh, yeah, I'm, You're yeah. wired. Just, oh, really? Yeah. So I, I could tell him. <laughs> and I'm just going to have you look right at me, okay? Well, I, I, the one I, I didn't... Um, oh, well, you want to restate something? Well, the... Um, I didn't... I, I muffed... I first didn't go to camp. Cross? I muffed the order I went to Indu. Where, well, where did you start your training and when? I guess it was... Uh, I guess it must have been... Uh, it was early in 44. 
Oh, it's where you were inducted? Yeah. It's where I came inducted. from? Yeah, I got it. Oh, you were inducted somewhere else? No, I was inducted. I went to New York City. Oh, okay. Went down there. To, how would that many would that be? Well, that's okay. That October, was just a November, general November, background November, question. November. They get hard. Yeah, okay, early in, early <laughs> in 44. <clears throat> well, uh, you got to speak? <clears throat> okay, ask me that question again. <clears throat> I'll get going again. Okay. Uh, what year were you inducted and what year did you, were yeah. you discharged? I was inducted early in 1944. I went from my basic training to Camp Cross, North Carolina. In those days, um, people who were headed for the 10th did not go to Camp Hale, but they went for their basic training elsewhere. So I went to North Carolina and then went home for leave and was ready to report for duty uh, at Camp Hale with my three letters of recommendation. Um, then I got a telegram the very day saying, don't go to Camp Hale, go to Camp Swift, Texas. I wondered how I was gonna ski here. So I joined my company, C-85, and met my friends like Hugh Evans and others uh, in Texas in, in June 1944. Then I had, we had roughly six months, I had month, roughly six months training, six months in combat, and then was wounded in six months in the hospital and discharged in October 45. Very good. Well, how about if you set the scene for me about why the 10th even came into creation? What was Minnie Dole's dream, and why was he believed the 10th was necessary? Well, the triggering events were probably the famous Finnish War. The Soviet Union had invaded Finland. There were pictures on all our television screens and Life magazine of heroic uh, white-clad uh, ski troopers holding back hordes of Russians, and it was a tremendous event. And people like Minnie Dole began to wonder, suppose the Germans or the Russians or someone would invade uh, New England and come in uh, from Canada, would we be able to stop them? So the original idea was to have a, a defense force just like the Finnish force. Later on, of course, uh, that changed. We went overseas to fight the Germans. But that was the original concept, that we needed soldiers that would operate in the snow and in the cold weather on skis, on snowshoes, to defend our country against a possible invasion. And at the time, tell me more about how the Army was really dedicated to flatland troops and how that sort of slowed down the idea of getting some specialized troops going. Well, I suppose the, the Army trains in flat, warm places like Alabama and uh, most of the training. And World War II was fought basically by our forces on modest terrain in Europe. So as far as I know, the U.S. Army didn't have any, never did have specialized mountain troops. And the idea was that we should be able to fight in the mountains. There was a, an event that made a big difference was the, uh, uh, the Italians had a uh, battle in the mountains against German mountain troops and were so severely beaten. So the question came up, um, should the U.S. have mountain trained troops, and Minnie Dole uh, had many connections with uh, high, uh, high people, including Roosevelt and uh, uh, General Marshall, and he kept writing letters and visiting and making his point across. Eventually, as everyone knows, General Marshall said, okay, we'll try you know, one regiment, and the 87th was formed, um, actually two weeks before Pearl Harbor about, on November 15th, 1941. Uh, the 87th Mountain Infantry Regiment was formed at Camp, uh, uh, at, wait a minute. Oh, what camp it was? Yeah, oh, let's see. Did I spell it? Um, the, you know what? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> this is going to be cut off. Right? You can pause. Uh, I do know it. It's yeah. like a fort. Uh, before Pearl Harbor. Yeah, so our first um, general marshal finally agreed to form one mountain infantry regiment, the 87th Mountain Infantry, which was formed on November 15th uh, at Fort Lewis, Washington, near uh, Mount Rainier, and that began the ski troops. Later on, two other regiments were added, the 85th and the 86th, and that was the story of the origin. Would you say that prior to the formation of the mountain troops, the Army was dedicated to flatland troops? I would say their experience in World War I um, had been basically, in not, not as flat as Texas, but 
modest terrain in uh, Europe. Um, I know of no Army mountain training before our division. I think ours was certainly the first division trained for mountain and winter warfare combat. What was it about the mountain troops that made <coughs> everybody want to join them? Well, they, they were glamorous. Then and now, the pictures of white-clad skiers swooping down the slopes, destroying a nasty enemy, uh, made good, um, uh, good copy. And uh, goodness knows there have been enough books and movies produced over the last 20 years that this is still a factor. There was a, uh, one of the important roles was Lowell Thomas, the famous newscaster, became early a fan of the 10th. And there were pictures on the um, paintings of the ski dramatic ski troopers on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post and articles saying, join up. And so around the country, um, people who were liked skiing, foresters, people who liked mountains, uh, thought they would join. And there was an active campaign, as you know, by the uh, um, American Ski Patrol, the, United, the U.S. Ski Patrol, to recruit people. And they would write letters to all the ski areas in the country to find uh, drum up trade. And we actually, in the end, um, many Dole and the people uh, en enlisted something like seven or 8,000 people to join us. And that's all they could find. And then from then on, the, it was up to these people to train others to uh, fight in the mountains. Now, in a period of time where others were drafted, what was it that uh, potential soldiers for the mountain troops had to go through? What made it difficult for them to get in? Well, um, I'll put, what happened was this. Let's say uh, there were about 14,000 troops went overseas to Italy. And uh, when they were there, then others joined us in Italy. Uh, who had never been at Camp Hale and didn't know mountain techniques. And of the original force that, that went up Mariva Ridge, there were something like 30% who had never been to Camp Hale. Uh, but what happened, and they had the commanders made a decision not to take just the Camp Hale people and fight the Battle of Mariva Ridge, that they thought it was important to have it as a unit. And so before the Mariva Ridge attack, they went down near Lucca and had training. And the troops who had not, did, not been to Camp Hale wanted to emulate their friends. And uh, so in those two weeks of training, uh, they uh, got, uh, went, uh, in those two weeks of training, uh, they learned some mountain techniques, felt a pride. And when the force went up Reaver Ridge, only 60% had been to Camp Hale. The others had learned techniques from their friends. And uh, so, the, the word, the word, and the, and the spirit spread to others. Um, a person uh, who wanted to be in the tenth, what did they have to go through to get in the tenth? Well, uh, you um, first found three people who would uh, exaggerate <laughs> and, and be willing to write letters and possibly exaggerate your skills as skiers and mountaineers and foresters and ability to live outdoors in the winter, and you wrote letters and sent them to to the National Ski Patrol and. Uh, then they would presumably vet these letters, and you would get a, a letter back saying, uh, after your basic training, you, are, you will be assigned to the ski troops. And uh, that's what was done. And initially, the soldiers who signed up for the ski troops got their basic training at Camp Hale. Later, uh, the Army decided to do the basic training elsewhere, and then you would go to Camp Hale. Did you find it ironic that, in a way, that there's all these hoops to jump through in a time when others are drafted? Well, it was, it was a, definitely a unique thing. It's the only time in, in U.S. history when a civilian group uh, recruited uh, soldiers for the U.S. Army. It's a unique experience, and I don't I imagine it probably rankled some high brass in the Army, but it worked partly because General Marshall had approved it, or because General Marshall said, this is what we will do and nobody went against General Marshall. I'm gonna pause for one sec. Um, I'm gonna put this rug underneath. S-P-E-E-D. Um, I wanna just back up the truck for one second and talk about um, how the mountain troops were adapting gear on Mount Rainier, how they're testing gear, how they're developing gear, uh, how part of their mission was. Well, one of the missions of the 10th was to test 
to develop and test equipment and gear for the mountains, and that they did very effectively. Starting out at Mount Rainier, there was a, um, a board called uh, the Mountain and Winter Warfare Board who supervised this operation. There was one um, um, operation where they sent a, the 87th sent a group up to the snow fields of British Columbia to test uh, weasels and other gear, and that was an important mission. And the, when the John Woodward, no, when John Woodward was asked to form the 10th Reconnaissance Troop, uh, the idea was to get the best skiers and mountaineers and train others. They wrote manuals, tested equipment, and that was a major uh, job of the 10th. And um, our troops actually used nylon ropes when they climbed Reaver Ridge. That was probably one of the first time the nylon ropes had been used in mountain climbing. When would other things that we think of in everyday life as being we don't even think about for Origin 7. Would it be sleeping bags? Would it be skis? You know, what kind of things did they adapt? Let's see, do I? <clears throat> Stoves? I mean, what kinds of things did they need? I'm not very good on equipment, just to be... Uh, well, I'm, that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking with the... Uh, I'm not really authoritative. Let's, let's forget about the equipment. Oh, no, let's have somebody else do that. No, no, that's fine. Um, how about if you set the scene for me in a sort of general way about what was going on in World War II at the time when the tent was created? I'll have to think. Don't roll, just let me think. We're, um, oh, this is, well, uh, <clears throat> we okay, ask me the question again. Set the scene a little bit for me about what was going on in World War II at the time the tent was created. Just sort of well, the, the two weeks after the tent was created, that is to say the 87th Mountain Infantry Regiment was formed, we had Pearl Harbor, and uh, the world then, we were thrust into World War II, and uh, that was the scene. And so the, the, the tent was brought into action at the ver two weeks before our nation was attacked at Pearl Harbor. Now, once the, the mountain troops transitioned from Fort Lewis over to Camp Hale, they very quickly expanded. And what we look at Camp Hale today is, oh my gosh, what a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. How about if you talk a little bit about what an unforgiving, what are the environmental factors that... Well, the environmental up? factors that, um, in addition to being around 11,000 feet high, the, uh, the valley has an air inversion so that when they started burning uh, stoves to heat the barracks, uh, there was a tremendous smog effect, which nobody had anticipated, and uh, people actually became quite ill. There was a famous malady called the Pando Hack, where, and many of my friends, uh, the, the friend who I went to join, was spent many months in the hospital there with pneumonia because of the bad effect of his lungs. So it was not a wonderful choice in that sense. Otherwise, it was uh, a splendid choice. Um, how about if you talk about some of the things that we don't really think about today uh, as problems, but could have been a problem back then besides the air quality. I guess I'm thinking about elevation, temperatures, snowfall, things like that. Yeah. Well, I don't think you want me to talk about snowfall out there. I mean, no, oh. Well, it might be challenging to people today. I mean, we don't think about snowfall as a problem anymore because we've got great snowplows. Yeah. But I mean, w could that, things that make things more difficult, environmental factors. Yeah. That if you were a flatland troop, these things, to you guys, it was a plus. I've not really thought about this before. Um, let's get on some other topic. Oh, well, all right. Um, well, let's put it this way. Did elevation affect training at for soldiers? How, how could elevation have affected training? Well, elevation affects people. Uh, every year I go out to, recently I go out to the Camp Hale area to do a trip up to the huts, and I come from sea level up to up to 13,000 feet, and uh, it takes a few weeks to acclimatize myself, and the same thing would have been true for the troops going to Camp Hale. Many of them arrive from Hawaii, for example, and they arrive in shirt sleeves in uh, uh, 10 below zero weather, and um, it was a problem. But uh, one of the things about Camp Hale uh, was that the by the time the soldiers left there, they were in excellent condition. 
and nothing is more important for success in combat than to have soldiers who can they can hike and walk and climb uh, and not and recover very quickly. They may get tired, but they will recover very quickly after a ten minute rest. And what sort of temperatures did people face in general at Camp Hale? Well, there's a famous uh, time during D series, the temperature went down to thirty below zero. So is the rain Again, I'm uncomfortable. Let's get off of Camp Hale. Off of Hale. Well, I guess I'd look for you to talk about it sort of in a... Uh, well, there's a couple more things I do want to ask you about Camp Hale. Okay. Can you just sort of cover the range? Everybody likes to talk about, you know, privates doing infantry-type skills and stuff like this. But maybe you could talk a little bit about what are the unusual skills that were covered at Camp Hale that are more support-oriented, like mule... I want to be able to touch on the mule skinners, the engineers... You know, people did more than just hone uh, critical infantry skills there. Yeah. Well, at Camp Hale uh, and later at Camp Swift, uh, we learned to use mules. And uh, uh, many people like myself never learned to love mules, but mule we did learn to use mules for transport. Uh, the key skills at learned at Camp Hale were those of rock climbing and being familiar with steep faces. That proved essential as we got into combat. Uh, and as everyone knows, the 86th Regiment, the 1st Battalion, and F Company uh, climbed 2,000-foot cliffs at night and used three fixed ropes to do that. And there, the skill and mountaineering techniques really paid off. Skis were used um, uh, in combat, mostly on, only on patrols, uh, uh, combat patrols and the reconnaissance patrols during the first few weeks in January were effective, and so of course we learned to use skis and snowshoes at Camp Hale. And talk a little bit about um, how the engineers provided support well later in the war, but what, what were the, the kind of skills that the engineers picked up at Hale? Uh, yeah, the 126 Mountain Engineers were a very effective and important battalion, and they formed at Camp Hale, and they learned there, developed techniques to make a uh, tramway up mountains, uh, and that was a very important thing. And as everyone knows, uh, on, while they were still battling for Reaver Ridge, the D Company of the 126 engineers built under fire a tramway up to near the top of Mount Capobuso, and that enabled us to send supplies up, bring wounded and dead soldiers down, and was a very important thing in keeping uh, that attack going, because once the attack once we had made the, won the Battle of Mountain, of Reaver Ridge, once we had run the Battle of Reaver Ridge, the Germans immediately counterattacked, and for the next five days, uh, the battle, the ground was in jeopardy. And without that tramway, it would have been much harder to supply those people. Okay. And they also cleared, um, they had mine clearing jobs, a nasty job of going on and clearing minefields, uh, building roads, uh, um, road building, mine clearing, uh, tramway building were essential features uh, that the 126 engineer, combat engineers did, and they did a wonderful job. Um, can you talk a little bit in a general sort of way um, why the 10th was called up to Kiska? Well, in was it May or June 1944, no, let me start again. <clears throat> In May or June 1943, the Japanese attacked the island of Attu, and um, let me start again. <clears throat> in uh, starting in May or June 1943, the Japanese began to occupy the Aleutian Islands. They first occupied the uh, island of Attu, and later the island of Kiska. And the fact that the Japanese had troops up there seemingly pointed the finger at combat coming to California. And politically, it became important for President Roosevelt to get those Japanese out of the Aleutian Islands. Uh, that was too close for comfort. Um, so the first um, battle was not fought by the 10th, but it was fought by other forces who went into Attu, not very well equipped for the nasty cold conditions up there, took very heavy casualties. Um, 
and had suffered physically from the lack of equipment. So General Marshall realized he had made a mistake in not sending specialized troops. And so then when the 87th had been formed, his first use of the 87th Mountain Infantry was to send them to Kiskit to take back from the Japanese that island. And as you know, the, uh, when they got there, the Japanese had actually left a few days before. American intelligence couldn't believe that they would have left, thought they were buried in the bunkers. And so there were the, in August 15th and 16th, uh, the 87th Mountain Infantry Regiment, some supporting units, and a total of 30,000 troops, the rest of them Canadians, uh, landed on the island of Kiska. And we took, uh, we had casualties. Some 20 people were killed, or either by accidents or by friendly fire. Uh, in that invasion. What do you think the 10th or the mountain troops learned from Kiska? Well, they learned to um, be careful at whom you shoot at night. And um, that's a friendly fire deaths are a factor of all wars then and now. But that was a hard lesson. And um, uh, I presume that had an effect later in Italy that. Um, when we were in combat, people were more careful and knew in advance. That may have been one of the reasons why General Hayes, when he planned the attack on River Ridge and on Mount Belvedere, specified that no one will shoot until dawn. And so we went up both of those attacks with bayonets fixed uh, and grenades in our pocket and were ordered not to shoot until the first light. And uh, so we, that helped, perhaps that experience in uh, Kiska influenced General Hayes, but I'm sure he was he would have done that anyway. He was a very wily, knowledgeable commander. After Kiska, do you think the mountain troops went back to the drawing boards in some way in terms of um, critical infantry skills? I, no, I think nothing special. We then went back, uh, we went back to the States, um, the 10th, uh, let me say, ask, that, ask that again. <clears throat> um, after Kiska, was it back to the drawing boards in some ways in terms of the mountain troops learning critical infantrymen skills? I would say rather that we just continued the training program that had begun before the 87th went off to Kiska. By the time the 87th returned, um, two other regiments had been formed, and we now had three regiments at uh, Camp Hale. And they were all taking training and uh, in skiing, other mountain skills, uh, learning, to, learning all the skills of, of mountain combat. And that was simply continued. And uh, in fact, it continued when we went to Camp Swift in, the, in June of 1944. Um, we took long marches and, uh, in the heat and uh, we had live, for the first time, had live ammunition. I remember you know, crawling under um, uh, I don't like that. Let's go back. Where do we go? Well, can I have you just set the scene a little bit about Camp Swift? Um, why was the 10th order to, cramp, to Camp Swift? Let me think about it. <clears throat> Ask it again. <laughs> um, why was the 10th order to Camp Swift? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. It's clear that um, the, uh, one of the purposes in, in going there let me, let me. Or what were they trying to learn there? I, yeah. I mean, okay, I assume yeah. they went there to hone, you know. Yeah, ask that again. I've tried to, the, my question, my problem is, I want to tell the story of, of that we had screwed up our D series. Oh, and, oh, uh, and, okay. that, and that we were told. So, uh, okay. Um, ask, ask that again, then I'll try again. <clears throat> okay. Um, why was the 10th ordered to Camp Swift? Why we were ordered to Camp Swift as opposed to some other place, I'm not sure. It's clear what the objectives and what were in going there. We had just finished the famous D series at Camp Hale, and although people don't like to talk about it, we received very bad marks. There were reports written by the Army, very critical, not only of the officer leadership of the 10th, but particularly the fact that we didn't have heavy enough weapons to stand up in combat against the German Army. Um, so. The, one of the purposes of going to Camp Swift was to reorganize. And when we got there, uh, we immediately uh, changed from a light division to a normal d infantry division, 
which had every regiment had three heavy weapons companies with heavy, heavy machine guns, light machine guns, heavy mortars. More artillery was added. Uh, arrangements were made to have support units of artillery. And without those heavier weapons, we probably would not have stood a chance against the Germans in combat. So one of our purposes in going to SWIFT was to reorganize as a standard infantry division with uh, heavier weapons. And uh, while there also, we had, uh, we gained a new cadre of officers who were excellent officers. And the, if there had been deficiencies in the officer arrangements for the division, they were, they were rapidly uh, fixed. And the officers we got were, that joined us there were, uh, with one or two minor exceptions, wonderful officers. And we were proud of them still. I want to talk a little bit about how the war was going in Italy at this point. It, um, by the time well, you guys I could add one other oh, thing there. Uh, another thing we did at Camp Swift was to engage in live fire exercises, which were an important uh, part of our background, to learn to crawl around with machine gun bullets whizzing over your head, all those difficult things, actually using live fire and um, in the training was an important part of our background. Also, we took long, difficult, hot marches, and by the time we left Camp Swift, we were in excellent shape physically, which proved to be one of the most important factors. You don't fight in the mountains without walking uphill, hiking uphill, climbing uphill, and it's, uh, it can be exhausting. You know, you bring up a good point here. Um, it was extremely hot there, and people had come from some extreme cold. Was it a little shocking? <laughs> oh, it was. There was a... The Army probably erred in getting us going too fast in the marches. There was a famous march shortly after we arrived at Camp Swift called the Medical March. Um, and it was, we marched out and something like half the division uh, collapsed out of heat exhaustion by the end of the day. I'm not sure it was half, but there was a large number of people who collapsed and, uh, uh, and had sunstroke and various things. So that was a, a, a rude beginning. And gradually, we got used to the heat. And because uh, what, what temperatures had you come from and to? Well, this was June, and from June at Camp uh, Hale to June in Texas. All I can say is it's a it's a a big increase in temperature. Um, near the end of the time that you guys were at Camp Swift, if you think about what was going on in Europe at that time, there had been all the problems at Anzio and Casino and. Set the scene a little bit for me about what did the tent feel like watching, you know, battles going on in various places, not knowing where they would end up, and having their skills not utilized yet. Yeah. Well, there were in the tent uh, many soldiers who felt very impatient. They wanted to get in and win this war, finish the job, and get the job done. And uh, when we were at Camp Swift, I remember an article in the, uh, our, lo our local paper, The Blizzard, which talked about the uh, battles uh, in, the, in Italy on the, um, I can't think, what's the famous, let's go back again. Like Anzio, San Pietro? No, the, I was thinking of the, uh, <coughs> ask the question again. I want, the, name, the word I want to bring out is uh, the Gothic line. Okay. Oh, got it. Okay. <coughs> uh, as you watched from Camp Swift, the, the famous mountain battles, or the big mountain battles going on in other places in the world, um, how, what were soldiers thinking in, in terms of what could the mountain troops contribute? Well, we, uh, we read the news, for example, of the battles in Italy, uh, the landings, uh, Anzio, uh, the battles in Italy. And um, some of us, I suppose, were happy not to be there. Uh, Others were felt impatient that we want to get in and get this job done. We had special training. So there was a natural ambivalence. But the, uh, and uh, many of soldiers in the 10th were impatient. They volunteered for the paratroop. They wanted to get out and do something and win the war. And they actually have to pass a rule saying nobody could transfer out of the 10th. So finally, they decided to send us to Italy. And uh, so that's not very, I don't think it's very good. Um. Why do you think the 10th wasn't deployed? Yeah. Well, I don't think I did a very good job. Oh, okay. What was, the, what was well, that question? Do you want to question? back it up and do it over? What or? was that question again? Well, it was, you guys had the mountain skills. You could see there were, yeah. and you were undeployed. Yeah. And there were obviously lots of 
battles going yeah, okay, on yeah. in Italy. What was our reaction? Could okay. have used yeah, some mountain yeah. troops. Yeah. Well, we did. Uh, let me start again. Um, we, of course, knew the battles that were going on in Italy, the famous battles of Anzio, and we knew there were fighting and people, soldiers fighting and dying in Italy, and many of us wondered why we weren't there. Uh, already we were mountain troops trained for that. Others, I suppose, were happy not to be there and to still be uh, having pleasant times in the, uh, on weekends. But the... Um, ah. Well, why do you think they weren't deployed? Yeah, I'm not very happy with that answer. Let's try. Oh, okay. That. Okay. Okay. So what do I want to say that we uh, we knew about the battles? Some of us were happy to be there. There was an impatient. Well, well, here's what struck me. This is totally aside. When I look at like San Pietro, when I look at the topography, this is your, this is your country. Yeah. Yeah. Those are your. Those are the mountains yeah, you trained yeah. for. And here are essentially flatland troops. You yeah, know, what, and crawling it, their this, way up th those mountains. This probably, why did it take so long for this is. I haven't answered why did it take us so long to get into get deployed. So I, I want to answer that question okay. too. <laughs> okay, sure. so start me off again. <clears throat> um, as as other soldiers fought in the mountains of Italy, what was the temp thinking, and why weren't they there? Well, when we were at Camp Swift, of course, we read the news of the battles at Anzio. We knew there were struggles, and bloody battles going up the boot. And we naturally wondered, some of us, uh, why we weren't there. We were trained for mountain warfare, why we were not there. Uh, some of us were happy, perhaps, not to be there, but others wanted to get in and get the job done. The question is often asked, why did it take the tent so long to get into combat? We trained longer than any other division, I think, in the, in the certainly the U.S. Army. And one of the reasons was that we had uh, received such bad marks on our training at Camp Hale after D-Series, that we had, we were not properly equipped with, our, with the right officers. We're not, we were probably not properly equipped with um, uh, heavy weapons, mortars, machine guns, artillery to stand up against the German army. So we were sent to Camp Swift in part to rectify that, and we reorganized. Every regiment received three heavy weapons companies with heavy mortars, heavy machine guns. We had other artillery with that, and we became a regular uh, flatland division in terms of equipment. Um, so that took time, and um, that was one of the reasons we were delayed. Well, let's flip the question on its head. What do you think about the 10th appealed to commanders overseas? Well, let's see. What's the, what's the tenth mountain advantage? Well, I, what I'm thinking just I mean, uh, here is General General Mark Clark in Italy, and he's desperate for troops, and he'll take anybody really. I mean, <laughs> I mean any division. I mean they were just they were hard put. So that I think the real fact is they would be happy to get any troops. The fact that we were trained in the mountains and didn't require. Uh, with an actual plus. So I just, that's what goes through my mind when I think of that. Uh, you can say, well, they were anxious to have our mountain troops over there. But uh, the real fact is also that General Marshall, uh, well, he, he put General Truscott in, in command of the Fifth Army, knew him. But uh, I think the real fact is that they were happy to get any, any, uh, any cannon fodder over there. Um, oh, 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 yeah. It, is everything okay, or do you want to redo we'll anything? Have to redo right there. Just right there? Okay. okay. Oh, so okay. I, I'm, not <coughs> I'm not happy with this whole business about Camp Swift, let's say. Oh, really? I thought you did a good job. It, you know, we're not spending a lot of time on it, except okay. I, as far as I can tell, we're yeah. just talking about how it honed your military skills. Yes. Yeah. I wasn't going to actually go through much more than that. Okay. I, um, how about if you just summarize real briefly? Um, what the Tenth Mountain Advantage would have been or appeal to any commander overseas, yeah. besides the fact that you have a temperature of 98.6. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which seems to be the main thing you have going for you at that point. Yeah. Now, what about the Tenth would have appealed to Mark Clark? Yeah. Okay. 
ask it again. Um, what about the 10th Mountain Board of Appeals to Mark Clark? Well, Mark Clark, uh, then head of the 5th Army, commander of the 5th Army in Italy, would have been happy to get any new troops. They were very thin on the ground, but especially as troops that were trained for the mountains, so he must have been delighted to uh, know that we were ready to, to go. Uh, how about if you just real briefly set the scene of what had happened right before the 10th got over there. They had been fighting up the boot, and they had been, you know, moving their way up the mountain by mountain. What were the, the, the three major battles before you guys got there were okay. for? Okay, all right. <clears throat> Want to ask that? Uh, yeah. Or do you want, uh, what? What was the battles in Italy before the ten, immediately before the tenth mm -hmm. got there? Well, I remember in October of 1945, two months before we left Camp Swift, the papers were filled with the uh, the attack on the German famous German line. What is it called? What is it again? God, this is where my Good. mind. Below the Gothic line? No, the, the, the Gothic line. line. Oh, okay. Let me start again. <clears throat> I want the, the word Gothic line needs to oh, stick in my well, mind. What battles, <clears throat> what famous mountain battles had just occurred? Well, I remember in October of 45 when we were at Camp Swift, the papers were full of the. October 44. Oh, start again. Thank you. What famous battles were occurring in, in October 44? <laughs> yeah. I remember in October at Camp Swift in 1944 reading articles about the attack on the Gothic line. And the, for two months, the papers were filled with that. And by just before Christmas, the, they had broken through the Gothic, Gothic line and were almost at Bologna. But then uh, bad weather, lack of ammunition, exhausted troops casually had slowed the battle down. So by the time the 10th left the uh, port of embarkation in Virginia, uh, the battle had, had stuck just short of Bologna, and uh, that was a situation when we arrived. It was called the Winter Line. Uh, things were fixed, and uh, we were called in to, to make a break. Now, why were they stopped there? Well, this was winter. This is early. Say that again. Why were the Allies stopped at the Winter Line? Well, they had exhausted themselves in terms of ammunition and blood. The, uh, by the time of late October, when the Fifth Army arrived at the gates of Bologna, only 10 miles from Bologna, uh, the, bad, the weather started to turn bad. They, they were out of ammunition. Uh, units were under strength. Uh, they weren't replacements ready for them. And they simply were not ready to uh, go forward. Also, the Germans had amassed a huge artillery batteries around Bologna and they knew there would be a bloody battle. So the decision was made to stop and regroup, and that winter was spent in, in getting new troops like the 10th in place and uh, more ammunition and resting and getting ready for the coming battles in the spring. You know, normally you don't think of armies fighting in the winter, do you? What was that? You don't normally think of a lot of armies fighting in the winter in the mountains. No one doesn't because it's, uh, it's, it's a nasty place to fight. Uh, I don't think that's, oh, okay. let's forget about that. You know, if you're at the winter line and winter's approaching, what kind of topography are you looking at in front of you? What do you got to look forward to? I don't think it's a good question. More, yeah. I, but I mean, it was ridge after ridge after ridge of mountains, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. isn't this what they were looking at, at the winter line? Well, the winter line is where they, they stopped. Mm -hmm. And um, so the prospect for the, for the, the offensive the next year was grim. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to. I mean, I mean, it's it's mountain, and then it's more mountains, and then there's some more mountains after that. <laughs> but okay, that's uh, one word after another. That's the hard thing about Italy. But how do we bring this in, in that question? Well, what what did they physically see ahead of them, topographically? Who? Uh, yeah. The Allies, as they were facing yeah. the winter line. I mean, isn't part of what made the, the winter line, uh, them stop at the winter line, was the prospect of another difficult winter facing more mountains? Yeah. Well, of course, this is when they, <coughs> they made, uh, we arrived in 
we arrived around Christmas, the 86 arrived around Christmas. The rest of us arrived early in January. And uh, General Hayes was, went into, the commander was then Truscott. Mm -hmm. And uh, Truscott, by that time, had made a plan to break through. The plan involved, first step being uh, Mount Belvedere. Well, uh, this is perfect. How about if we just had him <coughs> sort of talk in general about what the plan was? Yeah, I mean, rather, now than, we know what the rather than, you know, the Yeah, they're kind of stuck ridge. here, so how do, how do they solve this? So what's, the, what's the question going to be? Um, well, we know that they're stuck at the winter line, and, and their problem is how do they break through? Yeah. What, it, what is the general plan to, to break through? Okay. Well, when, as soon as General Hayes arrived in Italy, he was called before the commander of the Fifth Army, then General Lucian Truscott, and was given his orders to take Mount Belvedere. His plan to break out of the mountains uh, was the following. He, uh, we would first take Mount Belvedere, um, and with that in our hand, we would be able to go up, use the, the Route 64 corridor up into the Po Valley, and by the fighting in the mountains along the west side of that corridor, uh, could break out into terrain where tanks could be operated um, just north of Mount Dallas Bay. That was General Hayes, that was General Hayes' orders. As soon as he heard it, uh, he said, uh, who will be sharing the bullets? And he said, no one. So General Hayes, of course, went out to look at the uh, Mount Belvedere and saw immediately that it was overlooked by Mount Reaver Ridge, what we call Reaver Ridge. I don't like that, let's start again. Where do you want to start? Well, let's say, what's the question again? <clears throat> they, could, they were stuck at the winter line and they could see what the problem is. What were the tense orders? Well, well, when General Hayes arrived in Italy around Christmas uh, 1944, he was immediately called into the office of General Lucian Truscott, who was then commander of the Fifth Army, and given his orders, which were to take Mount Belvedere. His plan was to take Mount Belvedere uh, and then move up along the mountains to the west of Route 64, which was the main corridor into the Po Valley. And by that means, he planned to break out into the Samogia Valley, which was a low-lying territory that would lead into the Po Valley where we could operate armor. That was the plan. As soon as General Hayes looked at Reaver, looked at Mount Belvedere, he realized, whoops, there's an overlooking mountain, Reaver Ridge, and uh, that would cause many casualties because it's an excellent artillery observation point. So he then formulated a plan to first take Reaver Ridge and then take Mount Belvedere, and then we would go up along the west side of, and the mountains on the west side of Route 64. And that was the plan, and that's what happened. What had he learned from previous divisions who had approached Mount Belvedere before and tried to take it? Well, the previous attack on Mount Belvedere, which occurred in November of 1944, uh, failed. They only had two battalions take on the operation. None of them had special equipment. None of them had special uh, experience in the mountains. And uh, it was just an inadequately staffed. It was not the fault of the soldiers. They simply didn't have the forces to take. And they, they, they took and held Mount Belvedere briefly, but were knocked off by uh, heavy artillery fire. So General Hayes saw that, and he knew, well, I won't be doing that. Right, so exactly. So he said, uh, we must take Reaver Ridge first, and he then ordered the 86th Regiment to do that, which they did. Well, for many reasons, people didn't take Reaver Ridge. Can you name a couple why nobody had done it before? To my knowledge, no one ever tried to take Reaver Ridge before. And if you look at it in the wintertime, you can see why. It's a 2,000-foot very steep cliff, and uh, when the 86, the first battalion of the 86 regiment actually took it, they climbed at night uh, using three fixed ropes, and uh, only well-trained mountain troops could have done that. And we actually took that ridge with only one casualty. Then, of course, the Germans, following their usual uh, battlefield tactic, immediately counterattacked, and for the next five days, that achievement was in jeopardy as we battled furiously to hold the gains that uh, we had made. Eventually, uh, we did hold our gains, and... Um, uh, 
Yeah, that's fun. How about you talk a little bit about how remarkable it was to have General Hayes address uh, the division before Mount Belvedere. Is that normal for your general to give you a pep talk like no, that? No, definitely not. Uh, it's a f definitely not normal. Uh, as he said when he talked to men of my battalion before the attack, giving the whole plan away. He described River Ridge, and he described uh, what was going to happen. Uh, and he said, I've, not, I've never before talked to men at this level. These were sergeants, uh, privates uh, in that company. And let's say uh, Dan Kennerly has marvelously recorded that in, in his uh, fine set of um, tapes on his experiences. And that was a definitely unusual thing. And as Dan Kennerly says at the end of that speech, uh, it was like a speech of a great uh, football, com football captain. He said his men would have followed him into hell. And uh, so it was a very good move. And uh, the men felt that they were being trusted and they would do their best. I remember him saying, uh, when you get on the mountain, you may go forward in groups of two or three, but go ahead, attack. Don't wait. Get out from the under artillery. Go forward. Never stop. And it was an inspiring speech. Do you remember it? Actually, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm so glad I asked. No. What happened? Our company, if you want to go back, our company was sent as an outpost, and we, we were not in that group. Uh, I was already on the front line uh, uh, holding an outpost at Ben Quirciola. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. So I, so I, I, I ought to go back and make it clear that it was um, Dan Kennerly. I was quoting him. Right, got it. Let's go, go back and ask it again. <clears throat> Refresh me on what happened at General Hayes' speech. Yeah. <laughs> well, just before the jump off on the Mount Belvedere attack, General Hayes spoke to men of my battalion, my company included. I myself at that moment was on an outpost duty and was not there, but Dan Kennerly uh, from D Company 85 has a wonderful uh, story about that. Tells the speech like a great football captain encouraging the men, and he even said, I've never before talked to men at this level. There were privates and sergeants in the audience. And uh, he gave advice on what to do and said he would uh, do his damnedest to help them. And then by the end of the speech, Kennel reports that uh, they would have done anything for, for General Hayes. So it was a marvelous speech, and I'm sorry I missed it. <laughs> well, you had a good excuse. You had a note. <laughs> Um, tell me a little bit about how the Germans had been entrenched there for a while. They had had a chance to, to go ahead and dig in and lay out um, uh, mines and barbed wire and stuff like this. What was the scene like? Yeah. Well, the, the battles of River Ridge and uh, Mount Belvedere and the whole Mount Belvedere Ridge, the Germans were surprised. Uh, they didn't really expect uh, that attack. And that helped and kept the casualties down to a modest level. But the next major attack, the one on April 14th, called the Spring Offensive, when we jumped off from Mount Dallas Bay and eventually, in five days later, arrived in the Po Valley, that battle, the Germans knew exactly what we were going to do. Uh, there were a ring of hills north of Mount Dallas Bay, north of the town of Castellano. Uh, it was clear to everyone what we were doing. And um, we had, a, in spite of a huge artillery offensive and airplane bombing that area from 8 o'clock onward on the morning of April 14th. When that bombardment was finished, everyone thought, that's it, the Germans will all be dead. In fact, the seasoned troops, they simply dug in, and just as they did on the D-Day landings, the, all that bombardment didn't do that much good. In the end, it took infantry soldiers to dig out the enemy uh, with grenades uh, and uh, gunpoint and bayonet point. And that happened in, on the April 14th offensive. The Germans were not surprised, and that was a very, those two days, April 14th and 15th, were the bloodiest days in our history of the 10th. Um, the German soldier has a reputation for being very well trained, very disciplined. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what German soldiers were like in general in terms of training. Yeah. They were excellently trained, and they were excellent soldiers. Remember, uh, for a start, we had an air force. They virtually didn't. So we didn't worry about air camouflage. But the Germans had the US Air Force and British Air Force against them. And that makes a tremendous difference. They also didn't have much in the way of trucks. Most of their supplies were carried, were pulled by horses and wagons. I remember on being on Mount Delos Bay and hearing at night the German 
supply wagons and horses coming up, clop, 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 up that road north of Mount Dulles Bay. So they had no air force, and they had uh, uh, very few trucks, and they, were, they fought ferociously with a discipline. Every time you took a German position, you would know that they would counterattack immediately, just when, and if we hadn't been warned of this, we would have been knocked off our guard. After you take a position, you're tired, you're hungry, you're tending your wounded, and the last thing you think about is getting, uh, mounting a defense against an attack. But our officers made it clear that that would happen, and it did. Every time we took a position, there the Germans would come up at night, climbing up, and give us a ferocious battle. So they were excellent soldiers um, and um, a very tough opponent. Did, did they have any advantage? Did they have any advantages? I can't. Uh, well, let's see. You got trucks and tanks, they got horses. Yeah. But yeah. so they obviously could compensate. Yeah. What would that advantage have been? I don't. It's just they. Um, it's a good question. I don't. Well, they they were able. I mean, they just. You uh, were trying to break through their line, and they'd been there a while. Of course. That, okay. They they had advantages. Okay. Okay. I got it. Uh, you got the answer. <laughs> no, I didn't want to feed you, but I'm just. Am I okay? Yeah. <coughs> Go ahead. Well, obviously, you guys had been there a short amount of time. They'd been there a while. What advantages did that give them? Well, they had the advantage of terrain, they would, and it made brilliant use of it. Italy is essentially a series of ridges. When you take one ridge, then there's another one. And by the time you got to that ridge, the Germans had prepared uh, almost inevitably a brilliant defense. That means their artillery and mortars would be registered in. They would know in advance if you see a, a man or a company on this place, give these coordinates and the shell will go there. It's a terrific advantage. So when our attacks took place, they were always against a well-prepared enemy with pre-registered artillery aiming points. And uh, when you got that ridge, it would run beyond that. So it was a tough, soft underbelly of Europe to use that famous inaccurate phrase of Winston Churchill. And I can remember using that, saying, this is the soft underbelly of Europe. All of us in the 10th knew that phrase. And it was a continuous subject of uh, sad jokes. Did it feel soft? Oh, it didn't, it didn't feel soft at all. I mean, we knew that was a, basically, I think we all thought this was a huge mistake, <laughs> that we shouldn't be battling up a ridge uh, of mountains. But uh, that was what the higher commander decided, and that's what we did. It's a hard way to win a war. Yeah. Very tough way to win a war. Mm -hmm. um, think about the advantages that the Germans had, i.e., they'd, they'd had plenty of time to you know, zero in and uh, plenty of time to dig in. And take us back to Reaver Ridge, when um, Company B went down to add reinforcements to Company A, um, and at one point had to call for reinforcements, and, you know, the yeah, ambulance. That, that was actually an A Company call for reinforcements, okay. Right, and I'm sorry. Uh, and why, don't you, why don't you ask about how important our artillery was? Oh, okay, let's that, do it here. That's one of the things you had yeah, in your oh, notes. Yeah, yeah, because I really want to set the scene for people. <laughs> okay. About, Okay. Why is artillery important? Artillery is very important. Uh, it proved decisive in many battles that we fought. I, as I've gone over the morning reports of every company, again and again, I come upon a phrase, there was a counterattack, and it was beaten off by artillery fire or mortar fire. One famous example occurred on Pizza de Campiano when A Company had heroically taken that most advanced and exposed position on the northern part of Reaver Ridge. Uh, immediately, uh, the Ger they counterattacked, and um, uh, Lieutenant Luce called in for uh, artillery support. And it's clear it came in so close that they almost uh, killed Lieutenant Luce. But without that artillery support by the 605th, they never would have held that position. I remember in when I was on Mount Dulles Bay, uh, there was a counterattack one night that was beaten off by mortar fire from our own D Company. It was very effective. Uh, when B Company 85 took Mount Dulles Bay, they only did so because of very effective artillery support that was called in. This involved American artillery and the British 178 medium lowland artillery. The, um, one of the reasons we were successful uh, has to do with a, a successful in combat was that our artillery, uh, headed by Lieutenant C Colonel Bill Gall, 
developed a system where a, a communication system where he could call upon every one of our artillery batteries and the British artillery, if necessary, to all fire at the same point at the same time. And uh, he was well ahead of his time in doing that. So that was a very effective uh, phenomenon. And without that artillery, we never would have uh, been able to complete our campaign. Would you say that our oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, I don't, how did he do that, just off the record? It just, Was I, it phone? I mean, phones or radios? Well, right? they had radios and uh, they had telephones. <coughs> you can have the telephone lines, radios, and getting people uh, ready to do that so they would all have the same aiming point. So somebody would coordinate the artillery from various sources and they'd all come in and that was very effective. Now, because you're coming from different distances, obviously you've got to figure, do yeah, the math. Yeah, each person, each, each gun has to be registered. If you hit the same right. target, if you have, you know, ten, gun, 10 guns around in a circle or in a semicircle, they all have to aim differently. So right. it's, it's not that trivial. You can't and, and doesn't each one then have a, have a different firing time because yeah. length and distance oh, equals... Yeah. So the mechanical details, I don't know, but they did that, and that's, uh, I thought I would mention that as one of the importance. Yeah, uh, when, we're, when we're ready, let me know. I'm just going to have you talk up a little bit more.